Oh, hi guys. Welcome to day two of our Harry Potter read aloud. Okay, we're going to jump right into it. We're about to hear what the sorting hat ceremony is like. Harry had never imagined such a strange and splendid place. It was lit by thousands and thousands of candles that were floating in midair over four long tables where the rest of the students were sitting. These tables were laid with glittering golden plates and goblets. At the top of the hall was another long table where the teachers were sitting. Professor McGonagall led the first years up here so that they came to a halt in a line facing the other students with the teachers behind them. The hundreds of faces staring at them looked like pale lanterns in the flickering candlelight. Dotted here and there among the students, the ghosts shone misty silver. Mainly to avoid all the staring eyes, Harry looked upward and saw a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. He heard Hermione whisper, It's bewitched to look like the sky outside. I read about it in Hogwarts, a history. It was hard to believe that there was a ceiling there at all and that the Great Hall didn't simply open onto the heavens. Harry quickly looked down again as Professor McGonagall silently placed a four-legged stool in front of the first years. On top of the stool, she put a pointed wizard's hat. This hat was patched and frayed and extremely dirty. Aunt Petunia wouldn't have let it in the house. Maybe they had to try and get a rabbit out of it, Harry thought wildly. That seemed the sort of thing. Noticing that everyone in the hall was now staring at the hat, he stared at it too. For a few seconds, there was complete silence. Then the hat twitched. A rip near the brim opened wide like a mouth, and the hat began to sing. Oh, you may not think I'm pretty, but don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me. You can keep your bullards black, your top hat sleek and tall, for I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat, and I can cap them all. There's nothing hidden in your head the sorting hat can't see, so try me on and I will tell you where you ought to be. You might belong in Gryffindor, where dwell the brave at heart. Their daring nerve and chivalry set Gryffindors apart. You might belong in Hufflepuff, where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true and unafraid of toil. Or yet in wise old Ravenclaw, if you've a ready mind, where those of wit and learning will always find their kind. Or perhaps in Slytherin, you'll make your real friends. Those cunning folk use any means to achieve their ends. So put me on, don't be afraid, and don't get in a flap. You're in safe hands, though I have none, for I'm a thinking cap. The whole hall burst into applause as the hat finished its song. It bowed to each of the four tables and then became quite still again. So we've just got to try on the hat, Ron whispered to Harry. I'll kill Fred. He was going on about wrestling a troll. Harry smiled weakly. Yes, trying on the hat was a lot better than having to do a spell, but he did wish he, they could have tried it on without everyone watching. The hat seemed to be asking rather a lot. Harry didn't feel brave or quick-witted or any of it at the moment. If only the hat had mentioned a house for people who felt a bit queasy, that would have been the one for him. Professor McGonagall now stepped forward, holding a long roll of parchment. When I call your name, you will put on the hat and sit on the stool to be sorted. She said, Abbott, come on, Hannah. A pink-faced girl with blonde pigtails stumbled out of line, put on the hat, which fell right down over her eyes, and sat down. A moment's pause. Hufflepuff! shouted the hat. The table on the right cheered and clapped as Hannah went to sit down at the Hufflepuff table. Harry saw the ghost of the fat friar waving merrily at her. Bones! Susan! Hufflepuff! shouted the hat again, and Susan scuttled off to sit next to Hannah. Boot! Terry! Ravenclaw! The table second from the left clapped this time. Several Ravenclaws stood up to shake hands with Terry as he joined them. Brocklehurst, Mandy, went to Ravenclaw too, but Brown Lavender became the first new Gryffindor, and the table on the far left exploded with cheers. Harry could see Ron's twin brothers catcalling. Bullstrode and Millicent then became a Slytherin. Perhaps it was Harry's imagination after he, all he'd heard about Slytherin, but he thought they looked like an unpleasant lot. 
He was starting to feel definitely sick now. He remembered being picked for teams during gym at his old school. He had always been last to be chosen, not because he was no good, but because no one wanted Dudley to think they liked him. Finch Fletchley Justin! Hufflepuff! Sometimes Harry noticed the hat shouted out the house at once, but at others it took a little while to decide. Finnegan, Seamus, the sandy-haired boy next to Harry in the line, sat on the stool for almost a whole minute before the hat declared him a Gryffindor. Granger, Hermione! Hermione almost ran to the stool and jammed the hat eagerly on her head. Gryffindor, shouted the hat. Ron groaned. A horrible thought struck Harry, as horrible thoughts always do when you're very nervous. What if he wasn't chosen at all? What if he just sat there with the hat over his eyes for ages until Professor McGonagall jerked it off his head and said there had obviously been a mistake and he'd better get back on the train? When Neville Longbottom, the boy who kept losing his toad, was called, he fell over on his way to the stool. The hat took a long time to decide with Neville. When it finally shouted, Gryffindor, Neville ran off still wearing it and had to jog back amid gales of laughter to give it to McDougal Morag. Malfoy swaggered forward when his name was called and got his wish at once. The hat had barely touched his head when it screamed, Slytherin! Malfoy went to join his friends, Crab and Goyle, looking pleased with himself. There weren't many people left now. Moon, Knot, Parkinson, then a pair of twin girls, Patil and Patil, then Perks, Sally Ann, and then at last, Potter, Harry! As Harry stepped forward, whispers suddenly broke out like little hissing fires all over the hall. Potter, did she say? The Harry Potter? The last thing Harry saw before the hat dropped over his eyes was the half fool uh, of people craning to get a good look at him. Was the hall, sorry, was the hall fool of people craning to look at him. Next second, he was looking at the black inside of the hat. He waited. Hmm, said a small voice in his ear. Difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind, either. There's talent, oh my goodness, yes, and a nice thirst to prove yourself. Now that's interesting. So where shall I put you? Harry gripped the edges of the stool and thought, not Slytherin, not Slytherin. Not Slytherin, eh, said the small voice. Are you sure? You could be great, you know. It's all here in your head, and Slytherin will help you on your way to greatness. No doubt about that. No? Well, if you're sure, better be Gryffindor! Harry heard the hat shout the last word to the whole hall. He took off the hat and walked shakily toward the Gryffindor table. He was so relieved to have been chosen and not put in Slytherin, he hardly noticed that he was getting the loudest cheer yet. Percy, the prefect, got up and shook his hand vigorously, while the Weasley twins yelled, We got Potter! We got Potter! Harry sat down opposite the ghost in the rough he'd seen earlier. The ghost patted his arm, giving Harry the sudden horrible feeling he just plunged it into a bucket of ice-cold water. <coughs> he could see the high table properly now. At the end nearest him sat Hagrid, who caught his eye and gave him the thumbs up. Harry grinned back, and there, in the center of the high table, on a large gold chair, sat Albus Dumbledore. Harry recognized him at once from the card he'd gotten out of the chocolate frog on the train. Dumbledore's silver hair was the only thing in the whole hall that shone, shone as brightly as the ghost. Harry spotted Professor Quirrell, too, the nervous young man from the leaky cauldron. He looked very peculiar in a large purple turban. And now there were only three people left to be sorted. Thomas, Dean, a black boy even taller than Ron, joined Harry at the Gryffindor table. Turpin, Lisa, became a Ravenclaw, and then it was Ron's turn. He was pale green by now. Harry crossed his fingers under the table, and a second later, the hat had shouted, Gryffindor! Harry clapped loudly with the rest as Ron collapsed into the chair next to him. Well done, Ron. Excellent, said Percy Weasley, pompously across Harry as Zabini Blaze was made a Slytherin. Professor McGonagall rolled up her scroll and took the sorting hat away. Harry looked down at his empty gold plate. He had only just realized how hungry he was. The pumpkin pasties seemed ages ago. Albus Dumbledore had gotten to his feet. He was beaming at the students. His arms opened wide as if nothing could have pleased him more than to see them all there. 
Welcome, he said. Welcome to a new year at Hogwarts. Before we begin our banquet, I would like to say a few words. And here they are. Nitwit, Blubber, Ogmet, Tweak. Thank you. He sat back down. Everybody clapped and cheered. Harry didn't know whether to laugh or not. Is he a bit mad, he asked Percy uncertainly. Mad, said Percy, Percy airily. He's a genius, best wizard in the world. But he is a bit mad, yes. Potatoes, Harry? Harry's mouth fell open. The dishes in front of him were now piled with food. He had never seen so many things he liked to eat at one table. Roast beef, roast chicken, pork chops and lamb chops, sausages, bacon and steak, boiled potatoes, roast potatoes, fries, Yorkshire pudding, peas, carrots, gravy, ketchup, and for some strange reason, peppermint humbugs. The Dursleys had never exactly starved Harry, but he'd never been allowed to eat as much as he liked. Dudley had always taken anything that Harry really wanted, even if it made him sick. Harry piled his plate with a bit of everything except the peppermints and began to eat. It was all delicious. That does look good, said the ghost in the rough sadly, watching Harry cut up his steak. Can't you? I haven't eaten for nearly 400 years, said the ghost. I don't need to, of course, but one does miss it. I don't think I've introduced myself. Sir Nicholas de Mimsey Porpington at your service, resident ghost of Gryffindor Tower. I know who you are, said Ron suddenly. My brothers told me about you. You're nearly headless Nick. I would prefer you to call me Sir Nicholas de Mimsey. The ghost began stiffly, but sandy-haired Seamus Finnegan interrupted. Nearly headless? How can you be nearly headless? Sir Nicholas looked extremely miffed, as if their little chat wasn't going at all the way he wanted. Like this, he said irritably. He seized his left ear and pulled. His whole head swung off his neck and fell onto his shoulder, as if it was on a hinge. Someone had obviously tried to behead him, but not done it properly. Looking pleased at the stunned looks on their faces, nearly headless Nick flipped his head back onto his neck, coughed, and said, <clears throat> So, new Gryffindors, I hope you're going to help us win the house championship this year. Gryffindors have never gone so long without winning. Slytherins have got the cup six years in a row. The Bloody Baron's becoming almost unbearable. He's the Slytherin ghost. Harry looked over at the Slytherin table and saw a horrible ghost sitting there with blank staring eyes, a gaunt face, and robes stained with silver blood. He was right next to Malfoy, who, Harry was pleased to see, didn't look too pleased with the seating arrangements. How'd he get covered in blood, asked Seamus with great interest. I've never asked, said nearly headless Nick delicately. When everyone had eaten as much as they could, the remains of the food faded from the plates, leaving them sparkling clean as before. A moment later, the desserts appeared. Blocks of ice cream in every flavor you could think of. Apple pies, treacle tarts, chocolate eclairs and jam donuts, trifle, strawberries, jello, rice pudding. As Harry helped himself to a treacle tart, the talk turned to their families. I'm half and half, said Seamus. Me dad's a muggle. Mom didn't tell him that she was a witch till after they were married. Bit of a nasty shock for him. The others laughed. What about you, Neville, said Ron. Well, my gran brought me up and she's a witch, said Neville. But the family thought I was all muggle for ages. My great uncle Algy kept trying to catch me off guard and force some magic out of me. He pushed me off the end of Blackpool Pier once. I nearly drowned, but nothing happened until I was eight. Great uncle Algy came round for dinner and he was hanging me out of the upstairs window by the ankles when my great auntie Enid offered him a meringue and he accidentally let go. But I bounced all the way down the garden and into the road. They were all really pleased. Graham was crying. She was so happy. They thought I might not be magic enough to come. You should have seen their faces when I got in here. Great Uncle Algy was so pleased, he bought me my toad. On Harry's other side, Percy Weasley and Hermione were talking about lessons. I do hope they start right away. There's so much to learn. I'm, particular, I'm particularly interested in transfiguration, you know, turning something into something else, of course. It's supposed to be very difficult. You'll be starting small, just matches into needles and that sort of thing. Harry, who was starting to feel warm and sleepy, looked up at the high table again. Hagrid was drinking deeply from his goblet. Professor McGonagall was talking to Professor Dumbledore. Professor Quirrell, in his absurd turban, was talking to a teacher with greasy black hair, a hooked nose, and sallow skin. 
It happened very suddenly. The hook-nosed teacher looked past Quirrell's turban straight into Harry's eyes, and a sharp, hot pain shot across the scar on Harry's forehead. And that's where we'll stop for today.